Welcome back to A Better Biomed. Today I'd like to go over some rules that I've come to generate over 15 years in my career. Now these don't just apply to biomed, they apply to all repair fields, but I think they'll help people nonetheless. Let's start it right off. I've got 10 rules, and if you follow each of them, I promise your career will be a little bit easier. First rule, never ever trust somebody else's troubleshooting. When you show up on site, take what they say with a grain of salt and start troubleshooting from ground zero. Whip out your meter, start from the basics, and don't overlook anything. This will burn more people more than anything else. If you listen to what somebody else tells you, you're going to get in trouble. It's going to burn time, your downtime is going to increase, and you're going to order parts that are not necessary. Whatever you do, never trust someone else's troubleshooting. Number two, this is a very, very important one. Band-Aid fixes always come back. Always. See, the problem is, is the user will say that the piece of equipment has a problem. They'll knock on the piece of equipment or something, and all of a sudden the problem will stop. But guess what? It's going to happen again. It's just the way things are. Band-Aid fixes always come back. Now, Band-Aid fix doesn't necessarily mean you go up and knock a piece of equipment. Sometimes you go up and you wrap a piece of electrical tape around a cord or something, and you say, oh, there you go. Well, guess what? That electrical tape's going to come off. Shoddy way of doing work anyway. Band-Aid fixes are a lazy technician's method. If you don't put a part in the piece of equipment and you do no major changes, it's a Band-Aid fix and it's always going to haunt you. Every time. Number three. If you don't have enough time to fix it right the first time, you'll have plenty of time to fix it right the second time. Now this one has also burned a lot of technicians. They'll show up and they'll tighten a pipe clamp down to stop a leak or something like that when really the tubing's bad. Or, <laughs> I can't even believe it, I've walked in and I've seen where maintenance technicians have gone and wrapped duct tape around a joint that was leaking as if that wasn't going to fail. If you don't have time to fix it right the first time, you'll have plenty of time to fix it right the second time. And I promise you, there's going to be repercussions for the second time. Number four, it was already broke. This is a very famous saying around the shop. Time permitting, every repair should be treated as a time to experiment and explore the malfunction to improve your skills. Now this is kind of a big one that we live by around here because if you have backup equipment and you have time to explore the nature, you shouldn't be shipping the equipment back to the vendor. We had a camera very recently for a CATS machine, which is a cell saver, and the camera was going to cost us six or seven thousand dollars. Since the error itself was that the CCD was showing uh, low sensitivity, why don't we just open the camera up and check the CCD out? Wouldn't you know it, I had a CCD shipped in from over in Germany and we popped it in. If you have time, it's already broke. You're not going to break it anymore and if you do, well guess what? There's an avenue for repairing that too. If you have the time and you're not under the gun, open it up, explore the nature of the malfunction so maybe we can head this off on the other units that are in service. Number five, if you touch it, you own it. Every mishap involving that device thereafter can and will be blamed on the technician. Now this is also a very important one. You might have gone to that device and replaced the electrical cord, but guess what? Maybe two or three days later, the caster fell off, and they're gonna blame you for it because you touched it. Biomed had it last time, right? Well see, the problem is, is before you return it to service, you need to inspect everything and check to make sure that every piece of it is ready to go. And often, it's way too often, that people will show up to a piece of equipment, you do the bare minimum just to get it back up into service, and you put it back into service. Well, that's lovely, except we take care of people, and a lot of these devices keep people alive. So you have to check out everything before you return it to service. If it can be blamed on you, it will be. Protect yourself and protect the patients and fix everything on it that you can possibly fix and then return it to service. Number six, if you don't know the answer, consult another source of information. Now this is kind of important because there's so many avenues of information out there. You can either consult other technicians, manufacturers, vendors, or forums. One of the most powerful tools that every technician in every career field has is the online forums. There's other people that have probably seen that problem before. So instead of you sitting there wasting all your time, possibly breaking the equipment even worse and causing multi-thousand dollar repairs, why don't you just look online for five to ten minutes, do a quick little Google search, and see. Somebody else has probably seen that problem before. Save yourself the time, the man hours, and the cost. If you don't know, consult something else. 
Number seven, image is everything. Your reputation is only as good as your last repair. Now this one here seems to get a lot of people down, especially when your users get mad at you. That's just the nature of the job. You do every repair the absolute best you can because everything depends on their trust and your ability to fix it. If you mess up once, you mess up twice, maybe they'll let it go. But if you keep messing up, they're not going to trust your repair and they're not going to want to use your equipment on that patient. Image is everything. That's what you have as a technician, is your image. So try and respect that. Now, by this last sentence, your reputation is only good as your last repair. You can do a hundred repairs that are wonderful, save people's lives, it doesn't matter. You have that last repair and it completely falls apart in the middle of usage and guess who they're going to blame it on and it's not going to be pretty. Safety first is fault. Every repair is a calculated risk to the technician, not a gamble. No repair is ever 100% safe. This one here I've gotten in many arguments with people. They say, no, you can always do things safe. I'm not talking about using safety goggles and ear protection and other PPE. That's not what it's talking about here. You never know what you're gonna get into. Sometimes you have to put your own safety at risk because you have a patient on a table. Now I myself have had to crawl underneath hydraulic tables and fiddle around with them and that is a huge no-no if you don't know the nature of the malfunction because the table could collapse on you. But guess what? There was a patient on the table and he was in way worse shape than me. So although I calculated my risk and I performed the repair, it was a calculated risk. It's not a gamble. I'm not gambling here. So when I say no repair is 100% safe, that's 100% safe to you as a technician. So when you step on the field, don't think that miraculously every day you're going to be safe. It's not going to happen. I've been electrocuted multiple times. Sometimes it was my fault, but sometimes it's not my fault. How do you know that there's a fray of wires underneath the lip when you go to lift a cover off? You don't know that. How do you know that device had an open neutral and an open ground and it was hot and you grabbed the stainless steel case? You don't know that. The users aren't going to be that descriptive, that's for sure. No repair is 100% safe. Keep that on the brain, but try and minimize the damages. It's a calculated risk. Try and do things when you do get burned. Use it as a learning tool. Don't do that again. I mean, we've all hurt ourselves on the job. I mean, how many people have stabbed themselves with a flat blade screwdriver? You know you're going to do it when you're prying on something, and then all of a sudden it happens. You stab yourself in the leg. Guess what? Congratulations. Now your leg's bleeding. You're not going to do that again, are you? Well, maybe. <laughs> Number nine. There are two types of technicians. Lazy technicians are more expensive Non-lazy technicians require more hours. Now this one is a soft spot for a lot of people. They get a little sensitive because I say lazy technicians are more expensive. Now I can't tell you how many technicians will get a piece of equipment that's broke. It might be a quick repair. Maybe it's just an encoder or something like that that you can order online and replace yourself. But guess what? They're going to take that piece of equipment and they're going to ship it back to the manufacturer. Some devices that's necessary. Life support devices that might be necessary. but. When you're talking just an ESU, electrosurgical unit, and you have a bad encoder on the front or an irrigation pump, and all you gotta do is get inside, find that part number, and cross-reference it online and buy the part from a third party. Make sure it's the same part. I'm not modifying the medical equipment. I'm finding the part from another vendor, maybe even a used equipment vendor. Now, a pretty good example of this is I had a touch screen on a Belmont Rapid Infuser. The manufacturer wanted to charge me $1,200 for that Belmont. I looked online, I was able to buy used Belmonts for $300, the entire unit, the pump, the heater, everything, including a perfectly good touchscreen. So don't be a lazy technician, do your research, cross-reference parts, open it up, see if it's really broke. Don't just ship things out to the manufacturer. Why would you be getting paid a premium to do your job if all you're doing is shipping stuff out? We can pay anybody to do that. You're a technician. Your job is to find the nature of the problem so we can head it off. Non-lazy technicians require more hours. Now this is something I've definitely explained to my bosses before. If you're cross-referencing parts and you're looking on forums and you're opening up equipment, it's going to take more hours. Now this is a balancing act. Sometimes you have to ship things back to the manufacturer because you don't have time to deal with it. Or the risk, because when you open something up, you own it, right? Sometimes it's a high risk. Talk about balloon pumps or something like that. If you're not certified to be working on them, then you should be shipping them back to the manufacturer. Non-lazy technicians, it's not easy. It's maybe a little more satisfying. You get to open up the equipment, find out what's wrong, 
find a cheaper part someplace, maybe even replace the whole unit with a used piece of equipment for less than the cost of the repair. There's two types of technicians. Always remember that and try to be the better of the two. Number 10. Sometimes the only thing broke is the user. Try to fix the user to prevent future damage. This is a big one. We fix people too. We don't just fix equipment. We fix people too. A large part of our job is teaching the users. Just minutes ago, I walked into an operating room and they were complaining that the in-light camera was malfunctioning. They weren't able to route video from the in-light camera. When I walked in, I could see from across the room that the whole camera was crooked. It was falling off. And the worst part is, is just last week, I got in there and I complained to them at the same time because the camera actually did fall off. And I'm not talking a little camera. I'm talking a large, round camera that's very big, probably three to four pounds, suspended from the light right over the patient. If that falls while you're doing neurosurgery, if you're cauterizing, that's gonna cause major damage. So the fact that the users weren't checking their equipment, I always tell the circulator of an operating room, you're in charge of this room. You're in charge of the patient's safety. I'll turn to the doctors and I'll tell them, you're all representatives for the patient's safety as well. The fact that there's a dozen people in the room and not a single person realize that the camera's falling off, that's an issue. They need to stop, examine their equipment, especially when there's a malfunction. Pause for a moment, see what's going on. But it took somebody to mention that to them. So as I said earlier, part of this, you can stave off damages by fixing the user. Maybe not giving them attitude. You can give education. Users are usually very open to training. Just a couple weeks ago, I had a HANA table, which is an orthopedic surgical table. It's very complex, it's large, it's heavy. And the users, they were moving it, they were transporting it wrong. We had a class in the middle of the hallway, spontaneous. We had probably 15 people there. And I was showing them all the intricacies of this very expensive table. It's like a $250,000 table. And the fact that they're moving it down the hallway, smashing the carbon fiber spars into the walls, probably not a good idea. Especially when that's holding somebody's leg together during a surgery. So number 10 is one of the last rules on my list. Sometimes you have to fix the user. If that's training or if you have to correct them on the spot when they're putting the patient in danger, Either way, sometimes they're part of the puzzle. Maybe it's not the equipment, but make sure you document everything. Thank you for watching these 10 rules that my shop tends to live by. We go over these all the time, especially when one of the rules gets violated. Because when the rule gets violated, it comes back and it burns everybody. So thanks for watching. Give me a big old thumbs up if you liked the video. Thank you guys.